first up this morning, uh, it's, it's fantastic to welcome Guido Van Rossum, a man who should need no introduction. Uh, he's the creator of Python, and today he's going to be talking about Google App Engine and how it fits in with Django. So please help me welcome Guido Van Rossum. Please. Um, just to mention, uh, well, questions will be taken at the end of the session, and we'll ask you to go up to the microphones uh, op um, in the aisles so we can get you on camera for the people in Brazil. So, Guido. Thank you. You can't see my slides yet. There they are. <coughs> okay, so welcome to Google. Uh, very glad you could all, could all make it. I was sort of asked to give a keynote and I was wondering, hmm, what shall I talk about? Well, I can give my standard Python 3000 talk, but I've been, give, I've been giving it for two and a half years now or so, and frankly, even I am tired of it. <laughs> uh, plus, it, it, it sort of, the, the relevance is, is kind of small. Uh, the other thing I thought was, well, maybe I could sort of explain why I think Django templates, templates are so much better than, for example, Mako or Genshi, or all those XML things. <laughs> But I, I thought that, that would be sort of like, like kicking a baby, so. <coughs> uh. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about what I've been, uh, uh, been busy with for the last nine months or so instead of uh, Python development. And it's something called Google App Engine. It's a product. It is also free. You can uh, just Google for the words App Engine, and you'll immediately be directed to uh, our homepage. So I, I'm not giving out any URLs in these slides. <coughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is App Engine, what does it do for you, how does it do that for you, uh, what, is it good, good, what is it good for, what is it not so good for. I'm going to then uh, give a demo trying to about uh, how to actually use Django on App Engine, which is a little bit tricky, but actually works pretty well. And I've, I've written a large application, and I know other people have written uh, fairly decent Django applications as well. Uh, there's a big one uh, coming up that I can't talk about yet. Uh, there's also something called the Google App Engine Helper for Django, which purports to make life easier although it's still a work in progress, and I hope to uh, keep time for questions. Uh, so Google App Engine is a product that lets you run web applications on Google hardware, and it's designed to really do one thing very well, and that is running web applications. It is not designed to be a general computing resource or uh, any number of other things that could be cool and that you might want to be able to run on our hardware, but we won't let you. <laughs> However, running web applications is something that uh, everybody wants to do, and App, I believe App Engine is really sort of a very cool, very easy to get started uh, system that at the moment uh, requires you to learn Python, or of course, in your case, just requires you to use Python. It is sort of characterized by very simple configuration of your application and yet being very scalable and secure. So let's go into a little more detail. <coughs> App Engine really is meant to do one thing, which is handling HTTP requests. It, it, it really doesn't do anything else at the moment. The only way to get App Engine to do anything for you is to make an HTTP request to it. That is sort of like a remote procedure call uh, mechanism. You make your request, some processing happens, that's where your Python code gets invoked, and then you get a response. And this, of course, this works great because that's exactly what web browsers uh, let you do. It is also great for AJAX applications and other services. And there's, there's absolutely no need, of course, to have a web browser on the requesting side. It could just as well be some other application. In fact, we have plenty of App Engine applications that call each other through an, in, an interface uh, that is no different than HTTP. Configuring your application for App Engine is, is designed to be that simple. You specify a very small amount of metadata and you specify a URL map, which actually can be uh, very simple if you want to. Uh, there's absolutely no tuning or allocation or anything required. At the same time, the infrastructure behind App Engine 
let you, let you and let, let us scale to outrageous numbers. I mean, we support a very large number of applications. We also support individual applications that go to very large numbers of requests per second. Uh, we also allow applications to store very large amounts of, of, of data. I mean, the total capacity of our data store is pretty much infinite. There's, there's no actual bound on it. <coughs> now, we, we do have, we we're currently in a trial period where in practice, you're limited to uh, half a gigabyte, which is actually puny uh, from some people's perspective. Uh, you will be able to buy more, more storage uh, in the near future. The whole idea of App Engine is that sort of in terms of APIs, all the APIs are really simple and stupid. It's, it's, it's KISS all around. Uh, and that is actually done on purpose with a focus on allowing applications and infrastructure to scale. So here is a very simple architectural diagram. And this is really the architecture as seen by the developer. If you're writing an App Engine application, this is sort of what you have to deal with. So at the top, uh, the source of your requests, and that's where you send your responses. The, the interface there actually at the lowest level is indistinguishable from CGI. So if you have a CGI script lying around, you might actually be able to uh, have it working uh, without any changes, although you probably would want to change it to use more of the, of the functionality of the system. <coughs> Those requests are handled by a Python virtual machine running in a process. That process has access to the Python standard library and the source code of your application on the file system. However, the file system is completely read-only. There is no temporary storage in the file system. There's nothing writable. Uh, this is done so that we can replicate your applications and move them around very, very efficiently. And we don't have to worry about uh, sort of managing the disk space because we know exactly how much space you're using the size of your application, that's it, plus the standard library, which is shared be between lots of applications, of course. I mean, there's, there are lots of scaling tricks that you don't see in this diagram. For example, uh, if your application uh, gets a lot of requests, there will probably be many copies. Those copies could be running on different CPUs on the same machine. They could also be running on different machines throughout our data center. Uh, if necessary, they all have their own copies of the files, or they, use, they access the files through shared file systems. That is all sort of invisible to your application. Now, all these double arrows represent uh, RPC calls. On the left are a bunch of stateless APIs. For example, uh, because for, for uh, various reasons, we don't allow you to open raw sockets, or any kind of sockets, really just like we don't allow you to create sub-processes or threads. However, of course, it's necessary for a web application to be able to talk to other web applications. So we have a very simple basic API where you can basically ask Google infrastructure, go get this URL from somewhere else and send me the data back and, and the headers. So that, that API is called URL fetch. And I call it stateless because from your application's perspective, you don't store anything in there. It just sort of makes your request and gives you a re response. Uh, there's another API for sending email. There's currently no API for receiving email, although there are uh, ways around that. There's another API for doing things like uh, image scaling. It turns out Google already has internal infrastructure for uh, doing a bunch of image processing, like rotation and scaling, uh, which is, for example, used by Picasa. Uh, Again, you just make an API call, you send the image there with an ins instructions telling the, the image's processor what to do with that image, and you get your changed, modified, scaled, or rotated image back. This is how you create thumbnails, for example, if you were to implement some kind of photo sharing website. Uh, at the bottom are two more APIs, and these are actually stateful APIs. There is the big disk symbol is the data store, which is the totally persistent, replicated, backed up, uh, infinitely growable uh, data store shared by all applications. By shared by all applications, actually, I mean that uh, there is a single 
piece of infrastructure that handles data store requests from all applications. In practice, two applications can never see each other's data because in, internally it's all completely segregated. Uh, so there's no chance that two applications will accidentally see each other's data, and no matter how hard you try, you won't be able to steal another application's data. There's another smaller disk symbol, which is uh, memcache, and I think by now everybody sort of knows what memcache is. Uh, memcache's author work, now works for Google and has kindly sort of done a re-implementation that works well in Google infrastructure and you have access to that. And of course, it's not truly persistent because one of the guarantees of memcache is that sometimes it will lose your data, uh, but most of the time it won't. And it's actually pretty good at not losing your data unless you uh, tell it to expire at a certain time. So this is, this is a really great resource because the data store, given all the sort of the guarantees that once the write returns, you are absolutely sure that the data really has been written and it, there's no way that the data can be lost once you uh, get to return. The data store calls take a certain amount of time. I think it takes about 10 milliseconds or so to uh, make an RPC call to the data store. Memcache is, uh, uh, I think, under one millisecond. <coughs> is that right? Yeah, I think that's, that's about right, or, or even less. So this, this is what you have to deal with, and notice that in I tried to sort of indicate with the, the green background color that the application is the only thing that, that sort of, that you put in there. Everything else is uh, shared by all applications in some sense. So how do we do the scaling? There are two very different aspects to scaling, actually. On the one hand, uh, because we want to make this a, a free service for everybody, I mean, you can also pay, but sort of the basic service will always be free. We want to, to be able to support millions and millions and millions of applications. Uh, that requires some thinking because so it, it, it's well possible that an application doesn't receive a request for a month and then suddenly a request comes in and we have to sort of immediately sort of remember where that application is and uh, fetch its files and initialize a server to be able to handle that request because obviously we're not gonna keep uh, a processor around dedicated to uh, your service if you're not getting any requests. On the other hand, we also want to support some of those applications, and the interesting thing is, of course, that you never know which applications those are going to be that are very popular. I mean, it could be some, some completely silly game that suddenly takes off because who knows what, some popular blogger writes about it, or maybe you get slashed on it. And some people are one slash dot wonders, other sites actually take off and keep growing and growing and over, over months they, they, they grow 10 times and another 10 times and another 10 times. We want to be able to support those applications as well. At that point, they will not be able to run out of the free quota, of course. Uh, so at the moment, currently, uh, there is a mechanism whereby you can request increase of your quota and out of the goodness of our hearts, if we think it's a neat, cool application, our PMs can decide to do that. Some of the sort of, clearly some of the top five or 10 applications that are currently running on App Engine have had their quota lifted in that way. Uh, you can probably survive a single slash dotting on the free quota unless uh, you're really inefficient. But so the, the scaling problems are enormous because we have to support these really low volume applications, but very many of them, and at, at the same time support these very popular applications. Maybe the application itself isn't particularly big, but it gets an enormous amount of traffic. So at that point, we'll probably have several CPUs that are in practice dedicated full time to processing requests for one application. And those CPUs could all be on the same box or they could be on different boxes depending on how much traffic that really is. And the, schedule, the scheduling of all those things is, is not really my concern at this point. Uh, that, is, that is something that we have written a lot of software to, to do that. And in, in fact, I would say there's probably the 10% that you can actually see is what I'm focusing on, on in my talk mostly. And then there's 90% of infrastructure underwater monitoring, backups, replication, uh, making sure that everything is always working. 
And that sort of that that is what makes this a viable service. That there is that 90% of of background infrastructure, and a lot of that, of course, is built on standard Google infrastructure. And but a lot of it is also custom infrastructure software designed to sort of handle this particular need because Google applications usually don't have. I mean, Google applications are almost all of the kind. Like there's a small number of applications; they're hugely popular. They get thousands of requests per second. They're sort of also supporting thousands and millions of small applications that don't get a lot of traffic, but in aggregate, of course, still use a lot of resources is one of the novelties that this system supports. Uh, replicating the different parts of the system uh, in general is easy. I mean, it's easy to have more CPUs, of course, uh, dedicated to, to different applications or sometimes the same application. Although stateless APIs, uh, they're all RPC based, it's very easy to just have more of them. I have no idea how many processors we have dedicated to image manipulation, for example, and I don't really care, I just know that there are enough. And if the usage of that goes up, uh, we'll, we'll configure more or automatically more will be configured in some cases. Uh, memcache, uh, is very easy to scale by sharding. You just have different memcache servers that uh, serve different applications and you can do some hashing on the application name or some other way that the same application always goes to the same memcache server. And load balancing there is relatively straightforward. Then this data store, which is sort of the hardest thing to scale, that is building on top of existing Google infrastructure that has already been designed to basically scale forever. There's, there's no actual practical limit on how much data you can store in Bigtable. There may be limits on how much data you can store in a particular Bigtable instance because it's configured to only use 500 machines, for example. And there are certain limits on how much data you can store in a single row of the database because it's got to fit in memory at some point. Uh, but beyond that, it's, it pretty much it can, can hold as much as you want. I mean, all of Google is stored in, in, in big tables here and there. <coughs> uh, so the API for, for big table, or actually the API we pro provide for App Engine is slightly different. It's sort of a couple of abstractions on top of big table. That API uh, is very much influenced by scalability. And one of the side effects of that is no joins which is really sad if you're sort of used to your joints. On the other hand, what we've heard from people who have actually written scalable applications using uh, traditional relational databases is that the joins are the first thing they have to throw out. You have to start denormalizing your database schema anyway. Uh, Pre-compute pre join results, uh, all in order to be able to sort of have a database that is spread over multiple machines and in aggregate contains much more data than a single server could ever handle. So given that applications that, that scale to large sizes actually tend to have to be architected in a certain way anyway, our, our architecture pretty much ensures that you already have the right data structures and the right API calls and the right structure of your schema to be able to uh, be highly scalable. <clears throat> a little bit on security. The main goal of the security in App Engine is to make sure that the bad guys can't break into your application and can't break your application. Now, breaking into your application is basically prevented by making it really hard to break out of the sort of the enclosure of an App Engine application. There's the Python virtual machine and there's a bunch of other security measures. Uh, and we basically, we constrain what you can do uh, in terms of operating system functionality. I mean, you might as well think of this as not run on any particularly interesting operating system. You cannot create processes or threads. You cannot load dynamic libraries, for example. You cannot create sockets. You can't even write files, as I already mentioned. Uh, there are also a number of unsafe Python extensions like C types that let you pretty much write arbitrary memory uh, have been disabled. We have also disa unfortunately had to disable certain Python extensions that didn't look like they had the capa capability, or at least not intentionally had the capability of 
breaking out of the Python virtual machine, but where we couldn't sort of guarantee ourselves that they were actually written in a safe way. And we, we, there was too much code in some cases to, to be able to tell whether there wasn't some kind of bug in the code that would allow a buffer overflow to, uh, to be exploited. And we, d we just don't want to even get near that kind of situation. In addition, we also limit everybody's resources so that one application cannot suddenly uh, start sort of using up all the resources at the detriment of everyone else. Uh, so for example, we limit your application to 1,000 files and each file can be, can be at most a megabyte. Well, that's still a fair amount of storage if you sort of maximize that in both dimensions. Uh, you have to be done f handling a request in 10 seconds. If you're not done in 10 seconds, you get a warning exception, and if you don't, if you catch that exception and keep going on, then you'll just get cut off hard after a few more milliseconds. Uh, in addition, you actually are sort of, you are encouraged to make handling of a single request not use more than 300 milliseconds of CPU time. I believe that's the limit. If you go over that occasionally, that's fine. If you go over that regularly, we will eventually also uh, shut you down on sort of on the basis of being not a good citizen. <coughs> now, it turns out that you can do quite a bit in that time. Uh, and 10 seconds gives you enough time to make quite a few calls to the data store and other APIs that sort of take a certain amount of real time to complete a call. Uh, there are also one megabyte limits on uh, pretty much any data volume. You cannot have a request larger than a megabyte. A uh, response has, has to fit in a megabyte. Uh, a single unit of information you store in the data store has to fit in a megabyte. Uh, images that you send to the images API, messages, everything uh, has to sort of that. That is a limit that we might eventually increase uh, or again, where we might have a more flexible way of saying my application needs a certain number of very large requests or data store items or whatever. In some cases, it's okay to accommodate that. If we let everyone uh, use 100 megabytes uh, limits instead of uh, one megabyte, we would probably get in serious trouble and it would be too easy for a single application to, to sort of use up resources in the network or uh, on, on disk that, that would make it difficult to uh, maintain major decent service for everyone else. Uh, so the, the, the sort of the re resource usage limit I know have, has been sort of controversial. It is a very essential part of uh, making sure that everybody gets a fair bit of the system. <coughs> so one question that people ask, why not just go with Linux, Apache, MySQL and Python or any of the other P or R languages. And that is the industry standard and there are, there are sort of products that people consider as competing, although I don't think that they're really competing in the same space uh, that offer you exactly this. But I don't know, my personal attitude has always been, I've, I've been a very reluctant user of the, the super user password on any system. Uh, because it's nothing but a hassle. There is configuration and tuning and tweaking and you have to manage your hard, hard drive and disk space and making backups and recovering stuff. You have to deal with system crashes, hardware or software crashes, uh, software versions and updates and security patches. I mean, running a service, running a data center, even if it's, if, if it's a small data center or a section of a data center for an application is, is nothing but pain. Even if virtual machines can take some of that pain away, maybe you don't have to worry about uh, your kernel security fixes. You still have to configure all your, your applications, your web server and your database server so that they actually work together. And uh, frankly, there is a lot of, of pain involved in growing. Every time you grow like tenfold, uh, in, in number of users or amount, total amount of traffic or whatever you want to measure really, amount of data stored, uh, often you have to re-architect a lot of your system and sort of 
change the whole way that your, your data is spread across different databases. Uh, I, I read a paper about how the LinkedIn folks had, had to deal with sort of their continued success. And the number of total refactorings of, of their data structure and how they went from everything in a single database to a number of different databases, some of which were sort of transactional, others were uh, updated sort of offline or sort of whenever they felt like it and then easily replicated. Uh, that, was, that was quite a difficult uh, set of transitions and they had to do that several times as they sort of as traffic, traffic to their site kept growing. <coughs> so the whole idea is that App Engine takes almost all of that out of your hands. The data store will continue to support, support your needs for storing data, no matter whether it's measured in megabytes or petabytes. Uh, number of requests per second that we can handle, uh, in theory, is pretty much infinite. Basically, so my, my slogan, and I just made this up, is we carry the pagers so that you don't have to. Uh, and so far, I think we've been pretty successful. <coughs> uh, finally, people are always asking what's coming next, what's going to be the next language. And unfortunately, we're, we're using an agile development process, and there are all sorts of things that are competing for our attention. But I can, I can sort of... I know the things that we're currently working on within the App Engine team in San Francisco. Uh, one of the things you'll see relatively soon is a support for large file uploads and downloads. We're not going to lift the limit on individual files in most cases from that, that one megabyte limit. However, we're going to have separate APIs for supporting uploads and downloads of much larger files. Uh, think uh, videos. And that will sort of allow applications to, to deal with much larger and different kinds of data than what they currently can handle. Uh, the other thing, the big thing that I'm hopeful we'll, we'll actually be able to roll out before the end of this year is billing. You'll actually be able to pay for your resources, which means that the free quota, which will remain free, is not the limit. If if you decide that you want to handle uh, 200 QPS or 1,000 QPS sustained, in, or if you think you want to uh, store 100 gigabyte data in our data store, uh, you can just pay for that. And the prices are, uh, as far as I understand this stuff, and I'm, I'm a techie, I, I'm, I don't care really about marketing, but I understand that our pricing is competitive. That's all I can say. We will definitely be supplying more languages. The hardest part of providing a new language is always sort of the hardening, making sure that it's impossible to break out of the language's virtual machine or interpreter or whatever term you have for it. So you, can, you, can, you may be able to guess what languages are next just based on the popularity of languages. Uh, when the next language will be rolled out, uh, I cannot honestly tell you. It's, it's, it has been remarkably difficult to actually get the Python runtime hardened enough so that the Google security team was okay with, uh, with launching the whole system in the first place. So that is sort of what every, every next language is also up to. And Python was probably one of the most well-known languages within Google because so much of Google infrastructure is actually running on Python. So the final thing that we're also sort of we're listening to our users and one of the things that people say, well, this sort of 10 seconds per web request is just fine and dandy, but every once in a while we also want to run some kind of batch job that does some kind of sweep of our database, uh, garbage collection, uh, optimization, uh, pre-computation of stuff. And it's okay if it runs at the lower priority, uh, but it really can't run in 10 seconds. Uh, and so another thing we're working on is an architecture for allowing batch processing. And that, again, is something where you'll just be paying for your CPU and other resources used. And as I said, it's an agile development process, which I'm personally very happy with, which means that we have results when we have them and we don't have sort of, we don't set the time and then 
a, a date and say we have to release this feature by then, and then suddenly the team has to pull several all-nighters, and the quality of the feature is kind of uh, compromised. We, we don't like to work that way. It's too important to get things right. <coughs> so switching uh, gears a bit, uh, App Engine actually has a long history with Django. App Engine has its own sort of web framework called Web App. It's, it's really a very tiny framework. It's meant to be very simple to get started with App Engine if you're sort of, I mean, it turns out a lot of people actually learn Python in order to be able to use this service. And so they're, everything is new for, for them. They have to learn a new language. They have to learn new APIs. Uh, the web app framework is really sort of designed for that class of, of users. It's very simple. There are two or three things, the sort of a standard boilerplate, how you configure your application, how you configure the URL dispatch in your application, and then you just get going. And it's very simple. You write one method to handle a get and another method to handle a post, and that's it. Uh, so that framework, of course, had the need for some kind of templating. And long ago, even before I joined the project, uh, Django was selected as, I mean, Django templating was selected to sort of behind the scenes uh, do the templating functionality of the, of the web app framework. Uh, you can't actually tell that Django is underneath except by noticing the striking similarity between the templating syntax uh, in web app and the templating syntax in uh, Django. I don't even think we, we say in the documentation this works just like Django, although I, I haven't checked, maybe we do. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that it's stuck on Django point 96, uh, and it only uses the templating side of that. Everything else is, is done in, in a way very different from Django. Uh, we can't easily change this templating system to use a more modern version of Django templates uh, because it would break too many applications. At this point, we don't want to sort of do a software upgrade to the, the standard library and extensions in App Engine and, and suddenly have uh, users find that their application doesn't work anymore. And there are enough differences, subtle differences in the template syntax like auto escaping and the exact set of uh, tags and uh, filters and exactly how some of them work uh, that upgrading really isn't an option. We have a mechanism inside App Engine to version the APIs where in your configuration you actually say, I'm using API version one or I'm using API version two. So eventually we're going to sort of upgrade everything at once and API version two will support a newer version of Django, probably 1.0 or whatever is new, at, new at latest and most stable at that point. Uh, <coughs> but sort of, this is slightly unfortunate because it puts Django 1.0 in a disadvantage. If you want to work with Django 1.0, you actually have to actively remove the Django 0.96 uh, modules from your syslet modules directory. Unfortunately, we have some boilerplate for that. And then you have to make Django 1.0, the entire Django tree, part of your application so that it gets uploaded every time you upload or deploy a version, new version of your application. Uh, that is somewhat unfortunate, but it's, once you set it up, it's pretty much transparent. And now you can use quite a bit of Django. You can use uh, Django URL dispatch, the request and response objects, views, error handling, uh, the new Django templates. You can add your own uh, filters and tags. Uh, you can use forms uh, generation and validation. Uh, however, there are also some things that are not supported. We seriously, well, I should say I seriously looked into writing an app engine backend for Django's data, uh, database layer, it turned out that it was just, it was not practical because Django assumes that there is some kind of SQL behind there. And even though we, we have a query language called GQL 
it is not anywhere near powerful enough to support the needs of the Django database uh, backend. So unfortunately, we had to give up, give up on that, and you cannot use Django models directly with App Engine. Uh, that also means that you lose the use of the admin interface uh, and the management script and uh, unit testing, although there is, there is uh, hope for that. I don't actually know whether internationalization uh, works. It might well work. Uh, it might not. Uh, my strategy has always been to not even upload the files related to internationalization because I have no need for it in my own application. Uh, I, would, I would love to hear from someone who has uh, had success or a near success with this. <clears throat> so there, there was one particular problem that became urgent uh, once the, uh, the GIS uh, extension was contributed to Django. Django itself is more than 1,000 files. How great. Well, well, we'll just zip them up. Unfortunately, if you zip everything up, it's way over a megabyte, even, even with maximum compression. Uh, so you have to sort of make a decision of what to keep and what, what not to upload. And we ended up uh, having a fairly serious cut down of what we actually put in a zip file. And now we have a zip file that's about half a megabyte and contains only less than 400 files. Uh, those statistics were just from zip info. Uh, so we don't actually even need the zip file. If we just unzipped it, uh, we would actually uh, fit with easily within the 1,000 file limit. There are other reasons why using a zip file is still a good idea, because it makes the deployment of your application a lot quicker. Because every file that gets deployed uh, is an RPC call, basically. And several hundreds of files just, it takes the, the deployment uh, utility a little extra, and deploying one large file is much quicker. <coughs> so yes, there is some stuff that you can't use. Uh, I think eventually we'll be able to create multiple zips, uh, and it would be great if someone somehow figured out exactly all the details of how to do that and made, it, made a sort of a, a Google App Engine specific distribution of uh, Django where most of the stuff is that, that, that actually works is available as a set of uh, zip files. There's also there's, there's a project called Google App Engine Helper for Django. Not, uh, well, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's sort of contending for the longest descriptive project title ever. Uh, it has one downside that I can never remember whether it's the App Engine Helper for Django or the Django Helper for App Engine or the Django App Engine Helper. Uh, but I figured out that this is the official title. It's actually a pretty neat project. It is open source. It gets updated regularly. Uh, it was created by two Googlers. Uh, what it does is it monkey patches a few parts of Django. Uh, and if you inherit your models, your app engine models, uh, from the right base model class instead of the standard app engine db.model class, uh, you can actually at least support the managed script and standard unit testing and probably a few other things as well. So there, there is hope, and I think this thing will, uh, will evolve. It also turns out that it's possible to go the other way. Uh, I wrote a fairly substantial App Engine application uh, using Django from which I sort of have all this first, first-hand knowledge about App, Django on App Engine. Uh, and one of my co-developers said, well, I, I love your code review tool, but in my company, we would like to start using this, but we don't, we're not an open source company. We don't want our code reviews to be on a public website. Uh, and he decided to figure out how to port that whole application to running on a native Django server, and he actually managed to do it with relatively small changes to the application and a few uh, helper libraries and patches to Django. So I don't have all the details yet. I'm hoping that he will write it up and publish it on the App Engine website, because that may be yet another approach to sort of dealing with applications that you might want to run on App Engine, but you, that you also might want to run 
in a different environment because there, since App Engine runs on Google data centers, there's not, it's not perfect for everybody. Just, just uh, during registration, I ran into a few people from LexisNexis uh, who, were, who said they were upgrading to uh, Python and Django. And I said, well, try uh, running it on App Engine. And they just laughed at me. <laughs> Because their, their data, for various very good reasons, I, I, I cannot disagree with that, uh, needs to run on, a, on hardware that they own. <coughs> uh, so I'm going to give a demo. And unfortunately, because this is Django, uh, the demo consists of uh, lots of small files. Uh, and I'm going to just quickly go over all of those. There's app.yaml, which is a file it's actually a pretty small configuration file, uh, which is a standard file for any Google App Engine application. It tells the App Engine infrastructure the name of your application, which runtime you want to use, uh, which language, uh, and then it has a URL map. Uh, in the case of Django, we actually map all URLs to the same uh, handler script because the handler script invokes, uh, invokes a Django URL dispatch. Then there is a sort of the handler script, main.py, is completely bootstrap. It has nothing application specific. The name of the application does not appear in that bootstrap script. So that's basically, that's a script that you could just share with any, any app, app engine, Django applications could use the same script. And it contains a bunch of nasty hacks that are necessary to uh, do things like I said, get rid of the old Django 0.96 and make sure that uh, Django 1.0 is loaded from a zip file. Then there's a settings file, which I have sort of, I, had, I, I like small settings files, so I, I started with the standard Django settings file, which is enormous, and I removed every setting that was the same as the default, and then I sort of Got, was left with about a dozen settings that you really have to specify. And I think one or two of those uh, are application specific because you have to sort of tell, it, tell Django where your URLs are, where your URL map is and where your, what the name of your loaded application is. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not quite making it. Then of course there's the URL dispatch, uh, which you can I mean, if you know Django, that's a standard URL dispatch. There's nothing App Engine specific. I chose to actually make that include the URL dispatch in the application. Shouts is just the name of my demo application. Uh, it's a Python package, so there's an under under init under under dot pi. It has a URL dot pi, which contains the URL dispatch for this little application. And then there's one file with views and one file with models, just like you're familiar the sort of your standard Django project setup, except that the models file is using Google App Engine models rather than Django models. But Google App Engine models actually uh, clearly borrow some, some ideas from Django models, so they're not even all that different. It's, it's, it will look quite familiar. Then you have your templates, uh, and if you have static resources, you can put those in a separate directory and they will all automatically be served by I mean, I didn't even mention this in the architectural diagram, but there is a separate sort of backdoor for serving static resources where your Python code never gets, it, gets involved. So if you have lots of images that are part of your application, you can uh, have them served that way. And then you have, your, have to have uh, Django itself as part of your application. So let's see if I can find my live demo. <coughs> Okay, so yeah, here is uh, the directory. Can people actually read this? So here's the, the bottom half is the, the app.yaml file. So it gives the application name, uh, version, blah, blah, and handlers. It says all URLs go to main.py. There, there are no static files here. So let's see what's in main. Okay, well, so main is kind of ugly. Here we're deleting the old copy of Django, doing some path manipulation. Uh, import Django, check that we actually got 1.0. Now we import some App Engine stuff. Uh, some more hacks. Uh, specify where the settings are. 
Notice that the application name is, is nowhere in here. You can really just copy this into any ap application. So we, we should really have a script that sort of, you just like manage, uh, I forget what it's called, but manage has, uh, has a command to sort of get started with a new application. And it's the same thing here, except when you do it with Django, it also initializes your database schema and creates your tables based on models, and there's all sorts of support for that, and you don't need any of that. The, the, the database is completely automatic configure, configure, automatically configured. So here's your, your, your actual bootstrap. The main function uh, creates a Django uh, Worski handler and then runs that as a Worski application. This, runs one, this handles one request. And the App Engine infrastructure is smart enough so that future, if you get multiple requests and they all get sent to the same Python virtual machine instance, uh, it just re-invokes main over and over. It doesn't actually execute this whole file each, for each request. So your first request is much more expensive because it, it actually has to load most of Django. Uh, what else is there? Well, so this is the minimal settings I arrived at, and the only place where the application really shows up in the settings file is here. Although if, as, as your application grows, you might uh, extend this. And you, of course, might have some other uh, different preferences. Uh, so the application, let's look at uh, the models first. Okay, so from Google App Engine X, import DB, that's the model, the module that provides access to everything uh, related to the database API, data store API in App Engine. We create a single model, which is called a shout. And it has a title, which is a required string. It has a message, which is a text that's just a larger string, a multi-line string. Uh, it has a user object, and it has a time, which is actually a date-time property that will get set automatically. Uh, let's go to views. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so here's a form. Uh, to use Django forms with App Engine, you have to uh, inherit your forms from our own Django forms with model forms, which is part of the App Engine standard library. Uh, and then it, it looks just like uh, the, the new forms interface in, uh, in Django. Here's the one, sort of the, the handler for slash. Uh, it makes a query to the database, get me all the shouts ordered by descending time, uh, ask for the current user, well, this is a little bit of boilerplate, and then render the index. This is the post handler that check that uh, handles uh, post requests from the form. So it instantiates the form with the post data from the request, it checks if it's valid, and if so, it creates a new object. It sets user object, which is excluded from the form. The time is also excluded from the form. The time is set automatically, just like uh, with Django. Otherwise, if it's not valid, it just re-renders the input form uh, with all the error messages that Django has in it. <coughs> uh, oh, I suppose I, I should show you the templates. There's the whole template, not very interesting. Let's see if we can run this application. So we have, at least on the Mac, we have a nice little uh, application runner. Okay, did I click on it or what? Okay, there we go. I pre-configured it so that it knows about my application. It actually has an edit button that brings up, uh, it didn't configure my editor. But I can run the application, and now we're waiting a little bit, and then once the stop button becomes active, the application is running. So let's uh, actually interact with the application. So here is what the template renders. And there was already something in the database, apparently, so I can... Uh... Oh, darn, I'll... Uh... How about that? Yeah, uh, test. Okay, and I was even logged in. Now this is a development server, so if you log in, you actually get some kind of fake, fake login screen where I can say, oh, I'm logging in as an administrator. Doesn't actually make any difference. You can submit another one, so if I try to submit without setting the title, I get an error message. Okay, let's go back to our uh, application launcher. 
uh, so we can check the logs of the application. This is all running on my machine. Uh, so it, it actually shows me each of the requests that uh, were, were happening, gets and posts and stuff. Uh, what else can we do? We can go to the, the, the console. There's actually a little data store viewer built into the software development kit. So I can uh, inspect what's in the database. Let's see what we have. OK, so there are three shout objects in the data store at this point. So I can actually go to one of those. And uh, well, I can edit these things. And then if we refresh here, it will actually uh, see, the, see the difference. Uh, except I, yeah, I think, I think that worked. Uh, another trick is you can actually type any interactive Python program and uh, run it. So I can, can do something else. Two times two. So this is a complete Python interpreter. Obviously, you don't want to deploy this with your application. But when you're testing your application, this is awfully handy because I can do things like, uh, well, I won't actually try it, but you can very easily do random queries here and, and touch up your database or see what's in the data store and why, why the objects don't behave the, thing, the way you want it to and expecting them to. So another thing we can do is, well, we can stop the service. Uh, so now to, ch to check that, if I reload this, I'll get a fail to connect because it's actually no longer serving. Now I can deploy this to the live service. I have to sign into my Google account. Boom, boom, boom. It's uploading the application to the App Engine infrastructure. It looks like it worked. Let's check the dashboard. Oh, I have to sign in again. So now I'm the administrator of the dashboard of uh, my application. This is what the dashboard looks like when you're running on the Google infrastructure. Much, much more uh, solid. You can, there's a logs viewer. There's also a data store viewer, which has the same functionality. Oh, right now there's no data in the data store. Uh, I can check different versions of my application. This is actually the application that I uh, just deployed. And so here we have nothing in the data store. So we'll say, hello, Django con. I, th I think this pretty much has to be the end of the demo. And there it is. Oh, I wasn't logged in. So you have to log into the application explicitly. Uh, this is a security measure. It means that users will never, the, the application cannot detect which user is using the application until the user explicitly logs in. And the user is always aware that they're logging into this particular application. And if you're logged into this application, you're not logged into any other App Engine application, even though they all have the same appspot.com domain. So I think you probably want to kick me out. Uh, you have time for, for a question, maybe two. OK. Uh, who has a question? Uh, if you've got a question, if you could step up to the microphones in the aisles so we can get you on camera. And in the meantime, I'll, I'll just demo uh, the application that I was talking about, which is a code review tool. No questions? There we go. Yeah. So uh, with data store, what happens if you change a model? It's like if you change a model, there's already data in the data store. What happens there? I mean, can you, is it transparent? If you you can, add fields? Yeah, you can, you can certainly transparently add fields. Uh, you saw the, the, the model definition is just a little bit of Python code. If you add a field to that, it doesn't automatically give every object that's already in the data store uh, a field. new field, but all the new objects that you create, or when you load an object and then write it back, it will get that field. An object that doesn't have that field will get the default value when it's loaded from the data store. Okay. So cool. that it will have a default value in memory. If cool. you have more complicated uh, sort of changes, you'll, you will 
probably have to write some kind of compatibility code where you can handle all the new versions of your objects, okay. or you have to write a batch job that uh, does conversion. But simple schema changes like addition or deletion of a column uh, work very transparently. You don't have to do anything. This, the schema is not actually stored in the data store explicitly. It just sort of is detected from how you use it. There's also an, something called an expando model where you can actually have arbitrary uh, keys and values in your object. You're not limited to a fixed schema. So each object can, can in principle, have a different set of properties. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, when you were talking about the, the decision to use um, a, a different ORM, effectively, you, you've rewritten a, a, Django, a, a um, App Engine-specific ORM rather than using the Django one internally because of the SQL binding. I appreciate this has been in development for a, a while before, um, before now. Was that decision before or after Query Set Refactor hit? If Sorry, before the, what? Before the query set, the Django has just recently applied a, a query set refactor, so we've um, remodeled the internals, part of the goal of which has been to yeah, separate this, the SQL no, internals out of. That decision was done probably in January or February okay, of so this year. Okay. Long before we launched, we launched on April 7th. Sure. And yeah, so we, is, we, we had to freeze a bunch of internal APIs long before that date. Okay. Just to, it's, it's entirely possible that it may actually be now, it may now be possible because of that refactor. So that would be great. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, the db.model class that I showed as the base class mm -hmm. is actually pure user code. There's a lower level API called datastore.py, which we haven't documented, uh, but which is there and which is much lower level. Basically, each record in the database is pretty much a Python dictionary with keys and values, and the, keys are, the, the, the values are restricted to certain types. Uh, that the data stores supports like a couple of dozen uh, types specifically, like short strings, long strings, user objects, date times, and a few custom things like uh, geo points and uh, ratings, uh, all the G data types actually. Uh, so it's, it's totally possible that one could come up with a scheme, a, a sort of an adapter for the Django database uh, world that bypasses the db.model and go straight to the data store, uh, the underlying data store. And I would, I would love to sort of have someone look into that or, or, or work with them. As, as would we, and uh, patches are welcome if anybody wants to look into that, so. Cool, Thank, thanks for pointing that out. Okay, um, I think uh, we can take one more question. I was just curious to know, does um, the App Engine support all of the HTTP request methods or just get and post? And the same with URL fetch. Uh, we support at least the five or six major ones, uh, get, post, put, delete, update. I forget what other ones there are, but I think it's actually possible to support uh, your basic web dev stuff. OK, thank you. And, and that goes for URL fetch, too? Yes, both okay. of them. Thank you. Oh, well, um, thank you very much, Guido Van Rossen.